Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. you want me to get up on the stage? Is that what you're saying? Oh, man. All right. All right. Oh, so much different. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, we'll uh, hopefully get everyone seated here and get started. Wow, Jeff, I see what you mean. You can't see anybody. All right. Well, welcome to our third church family meeting. Um, we do have some new information for you. I think that was uh, the biggest question I got over the last couple of days is, what's new? What are you going to tell? And I you know, had to do the whole, you have to come and find out uh, sort of thing. But we are very, very glad you're here. These are very, very important meetings. And, um, you know, overall, the vision has not changed the plans um, that have not changed in terms of uh, the neighborhood, neighborhood church vision. But what we're getting back from you, the feedback, the questions that we're getting for you, they are extremely helpful as we refine the plans. How do we go about uh, moving forward with uh, some of the big uh, issues that are on the table? Obviously, Shepherd's Heart, the fourth campus. And it has been this interaction with you, the feedback we've gotten from you, that has helped us sort of make those necessary adjustments. And you're going to hear about some of those today. We are making adjustments to the plans. We are uh, moving some things around a little bit. We're going to be even moving some dates around a little bit, again, because of the feedback that we've gotten from you. So today, again, we are asking for you to ask the questions. Tell us what's on your mind. Ask us whatever those questions are to help you get clarification and help you understand uh, to the level you need to uh, to join us as we move forward. Because this isn't about what the church staff is doing. It's about what we as a church are doing together. So it's very, very important that all of you are doing this with us. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, we very much welcome your input and appreciate that you're, you're here to provide that. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Tracy Barbel if she'll open us up in prayer and then we'll get started. Tracy's on our executive council, by the way. Lord of heaven and earth, we um, thank you for your presence here in this room. I pray that there would just be a tangible sense of your moving in our hearts. And I ask God that you would move our hearts in the direction of your will, that you would um, give us words that help speak what it is that um, you want us to hear, give us ears to hear that. Um, we thank you. God, for who you are, for your goodness, and for the way that you are blessing this church, for the way that you're leading us. We thank you for the mission and the vision and um, for the strength that you have given us to walk that way. So um, we just pray that we would hear you and that we would be obedient. And we ask this in Jesus' name today. And everyone said, amen. amen. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Get your Diet Coke out of there, Ken. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for showing up to this meeting. I was pulling in. I was preaching at the South Street campus, and there was a bit of a traffic jam on the way over. If I was getting out of there, making my way here, and I saw all these young families driving out and walking out, and I was kind of stopped, and, they, and some of them looked over and recognized me, and then I, I could see on their face, it dawned on them that they're leaving, and I'm coming to the meeting, and I could see they felt bad. One of them <laughs> rolled down the window. Oh, we're, we're going to listen online later. I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. You can go. And so, I know it's a beautiful day, and I know that you could be other places, but it means a lot to us in leadership uh, that you care enough to be here. And there are many, many others who will watch online later and, and keep up with this. So I'm excited to talk to you about uh, kind of the ongoing unfolding of where God's taking us and where he's leading us. As Ken said, really the direction and trajectory has not changed. The neighborhood church vision has not changed. But because of the dialogue we're having with many of you, uh, God is uh, shaping the details in a good way. We think it's going to produce better plans, uh, even better plans as we go forward. So um, first thing, I just want to review a little bit and talk about where, what we're, what, why we're here, what we're talking about. So uh, by way of review, it's good to keep reviewing these things. I know in a church our size with the multiple venues and multiple locations, um, I make the presumption that because I've said something once that everybody gets it. That's about the time I'm sick of saying something, the average person is just starting to go, oh, wait, what? So I know that we, need, we all need to be on the same page together, and that takes some time. So just to review, we're talking about two major initiatives as part of the, under the umbrella of the neighborhood church vision. 
Uh, one of them is our compassion ministry called Shepherd's Heart, and it's so much more than a food pantry. Most of you know that, but in case you uh, don't, and we just uh, and reaffirm that, that Shepherd's Heart is the umbrella term over all of our, uh, these ministries of compassion. Uh, the tip of the spear is the food pantry. It's the one that gets a lot of publicity, right, Aaron? But if there's so much more that goes on. Job coaching, budgeting teams, counseling, administer justice, legal assistance. And that's just the beginning of many things that are happening with, uh, with bilingual uh, ministry happening with Spanish speakers there. Uh, also, we're seeing many people that are, it, it becomes an, an entry point, an on-ramp to the life of Christ and the life in our church for many, many people. There's a number of them who are coming full circle now, serving and doing for others what's been done for them. Aaron could tell you stories, but we're, we see God continuing to bless this ministry and expand what it, what's happening and what it could potentially could happen. But the biggest challenge is it is out of space, and we have to expand its capacity physically to continue to, to allow God to do what he's doing. So we have, this, I know this is review, but I'm going to go through it again. So we began to look at it over a year ago, where? Where, do we, where should we put it? We looked at options of moving it off-site, renting or buying a facility off-campus. Some of you have brought that up, mentioned it, or wondered that yourself. We began to realize as we explored that possibility that while we could do that, it immediately changes what Shepherd's Heart is if we take it off of one of our campuses. It ceases to be part of us and becomes another food pantry in the community. The interaction with our staff, with, the, with many of you who come throughout the week, is very, very important. It makes it unique. It makes it special. And we didn't want to lose that. So we wanted to keep it on our campus. Then the next question was, okay, well, why not this campus? Lots of land here, lots of space here. Why not move it here? We felt like, uh, after exploring possibilities there, the strategic use of the South Street campus was important for a couple of reasons. And I've been through this again. You can go and watch it online, but I'll just do it in brief. The South Street campus is 47 or almost 48,000 square feet that we own. We could not reproduce that square footage for anywhere near what it would cost us uh, to buy. We couldn't sell it for anywhere near what it would cost us to reproduce it if we were to build it, is what my point is. And we own it free and clear. What's the best strategic use of that facility, given the fact that it's less than a mile away from this facility, which is our largest single venue, single campus? We believe it's three things. Vibrant and excellent traditional worship, which we're committed to. Number one. Number two, the nerve center for our administrative hub of, of all of Chapel Street Church, our offices and, and the central services for Chapel Street Church, neighborhood church vision. Number three, the location, the primary location, I should say, and the central location for our compassion ministry in the community called Shepherd's Heart. That's why we thought we should keep it, we'd have to keep the South Street campus. Kick it to a campus and at South Street. Then the question is, well, where at South Street? And as many of you know and are here to talk about and want to hear about, we explored lots of opportunities and, and felt the best plan was to put it in what is now the chapel. That compromises the use of that room. Many of you made that clear. It raises lots of other questions. We wrestled through that. And we're operating for a long time feeling that was still the best plan. No matter where we put it, it was going to Something was going to be compromised unless you're building new square footage. We had plans to, uh, those who meet in the chapel could meet in the student center to reproduce purpose some of that. And we had lots of plans to, to accommodate ministry. But as many of you have expressed, it still was, that was hard to hear because the room is important to you and to us as well. The big question then that I was feeling like I needed to answer was, well, why won't the lower level work? If we know why not off campus, and if we know not, why not this campus, why not the lower level at South Street? As, as I think, as, I think uh, Lynn Entz, if, I don't know if he's here, who he was here last meeting, mentioned, hey, and he expressed what many of us have wondered, well, there's a lot of space down there that's not being used. Well, I just want to let you know that, that we had worked with our design build firm Aspen, and I was told, and we were told, hey, you won't get as good a solution, and it's going to cost you more money the way the building's designed. But I still felt like I needed, we needed to explore that possibility one more time. And I want to be honest with you. I know when people say I want to be honest, it sounds like, were well, you always dishonest? No, I don't mean it that way. But... <laughs> This, I'm saying more than I, uh, I, I went into this meeting, which we had just earlier this week with Aspen, our design build firm, to look at the lower level. And I, I was looking to that meeting to show me uh, how to answer the question, why not the lower level? Because I knew it wasn't going to work in the lower level. And I, and I just want to be, have a better answer to that question. Um, and so I went into the meeting thinking, this isn't going to work, and now I can ex explain why. And I'm not exaggerating that I think God did something pretty astounding in that meeting. I came out of the meeting thinking not only could it actually work in the lower level, it might actually be preferable. Now, we have a long way to go. I don't want to make any promises to you because we don't even know costs yet. We're still working on that. 
but it's conceivable that we're, we, are, we are back in the truck up a bit and re-exploring the possibility of a lower level option for the Shepherd's Heart that would not only be work, but it would be beautiful and, and be wonderful and, and, and create as much or more space than we currently were planning uh, and preserve uh, lots of other things. Now, there's a lot of questions you're gonna have with that. Where does the money go? How would it work? There's some things we wouldn't be able to do finance, financial cost wise. And there's a lot of questions I cannot yet answer, but I want you to know Part of it is because you've asked the question and we revisited what we thought we already knew. And in that process, God is showing us that maybe there's something here we didn't yet see and we're doing that. So I'm not promising that, but I want you to know that. So uh, uh, we don't, if you were coming here expecting to see the plans, uh, we don't have those because we're, we're, we're going back, not quite to the drawing board, but we're back in the truck up a bit. Anything more to add, add to that, guys, that I missed there? Um, so you can ask questions later about that, but I want, that's where Shepherd's Heart stands. We are 100% committed to expanding its capacity at the South Street location. We think there's an option that would be honoring and wonderful to our guests and that would st stay at South Street in the lower level. The big questions I was concerned about is, is it gonna be a less than optimal, optimal option? Is it gonna be not workable for our growth? And is it gonna feel like we're making our guests go in the back of the church? We don't wanna do that, they're our neighbors. We love them and they're part of their, and, and, and I think there's a way to do that that, wouldn't, that would be meet both those needs and answer that well. So, but, but we have a lot of sharpening of the pencil to do on structural walls and where things go and, and, and how the entrance would look and so on. So I mean, um, I'll, I'll move on. We can come back to that later. So, but that means we're going to have to push back. None of you knew this, but we were thinking about, well, maybe some of you knew this, but most of you probably didn't. Well, you might have. I don't know. <laughs> I mentioned at our last meeting... <laughs> that we were thinking about having our church family vote, because this is all moving toward a vote, on the 22nd of March. Anybody remember me saying that? It wasn't on the screen, but I did mention that. We're gonna push that back to after Easter. We, so nobody, no, just me, it's in my head. We're gonna push our vote back to, to after Easter. We think that's the wisest course for a number of reasons, one of which is we have more work to do with the lower level. Uh, but Erin's been down there, she's been part of these conversations, as has Dave Wild, Dave's here, who was an architect that's worked on a number of our expansions, and uh, I can tell you, without reservation, that I really was walking the meeting going, okay, just give me the ammunition to answer this question so we can move on. And it came out going, oh, this could be better. This could really be better. So more to come on that. We'll see what God does. Keep praying as I know that you are. Uh, moving now to the neighborhood church vision, which we want to spend some time talking about. And really we have three things to cover. Shepherd's Heart, which I just mentioned. Fourth Campus, uh, which I'll mention here in a minute. And then, the, then we'll bring Abe up to talk about our financial health and picture and how we plan to attack this from a financial uh, standpoint. So it, in order to introduce again uh, our fourth campus uh, potential and what we'll be talking about in a few moments, we want to show you a video from a very wise individual. It's always weird to introduce yourself on video, but let's watch this together. I spend a lot of time thinking and praying about where God's leading us as a church, asking him the question, where are you taking us, God? What kind of church do you want us to become? And in general terms, I think we already know that. He's made it clear that we're becoming a family of neighborhood churches where more people can experience his grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where they are. And it's so exciting to see that, and that's happening across all of our ministries and our various locations. But every now and then, God gets specific with us. He gives us a clearer picture of what that is supposed to look like. And he shows us exactly what he wants for us in this next leg of our journey as a neighborhood church. We're excited to show it to you. Here it is. Cornerstone Community Church. It started as a conversation between two neighbors. Alan, on our staff, talking to his neighbor, Frank. Frank is the pastor of Cornerstone Community Church right here in this neighborhood. And Frank asked Alan if our church would consider merging with them or taking them over. Alan didn't know, and he said he'd find out. And we began to talk, we met for breakfast, and I've gotten to know Pastor Frank, and it seems very apparent that God is indeed in this opportunity. You know, I watch HGTV, and one of the shows on that channel I like is the show House Hunters. You've probably seen it. Some families looking for a new home and they give them all these options. And every time, what those families are looking for is always, they look at the inside of the house. Does the kitchen have new countertops? Are the bathrooms redone? Are the hardwood floors? All that kind of stuff. Or they look at the outside of the house. Is it beautiful? Is the landscaping 
nice and that's all good. You should look at that. But nobody's ever asked the question, what are the neighbors like around this house? Who lives nearby? And you know they should ask that question because who you live near should impact what your life is like. The people that live next to you, across the street from you, all around you, should make your life better. Nowhere is that more true than with the church. We should be, Christ followers, a gift to our neighborhoods, to our communities, to the people living around us. And our church as a whole should be a gift and a blessing to its city and neighborhoods around it. You know, maybe the solution to all the societal problems we keep talking about has been right under our noses all along. Maybe it's 2,000 years old. Maybe Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe that's really what this is about. God's people loving him with all their heart and loving the people around them. That's what we believe is at the heart of the Neighborhood Church mission. And that's why we're exploring these opportunities. Eugene Peterson in his message translation says in John chapter 1 verse 14 that God moved into the neighborhood, our neighborhood. He came to us. And that's what we're supposed to do as a church, to come into the world, into the neighborhood, to make it a better place, to bless the people around us. Whether or not they ever come to the church itself, we come to them to help them experience God's grace, grow in their faith, and make an impact. And we want to ask you to do two things. Number one, continue to pray for ways that you can love your neighbors well. And number two, pray with us for this opportunity here in North Aurora, that God would unify us and clarify this vision as we move forward truly becoming a neighborhood church. Funny story about shooting that video. We went out there right when school was uh, getting out. At, uh, remember that, Frank? So we were going to shoot and walk down that, uh, the, the, the sidewalk and talk about neighborhood church vision. And so Peter, our videographer, and, and Stetson, our communications director, were out there with us. And, and all these families are pulling up because they wait in the church parking, or parking lot to pick up their kids from school. They wait across the church parking lot. So they're just coming in. And, and we're trying to, and you can't really do a dialogue when there's cars driving by. On the, in the, so um, we're trying to figure out a time to do this. And they're all looking at us like, what are those guys doing with cameras? And are we in trouble? And is there a news crew looking for helicopters or something like this, you know? So, but it really was, I had this little vision, uh, this little picture as we were waiting to do this video of just the very thing, a church and its relationship with the community. Uh, and so Pastor Frank and his wife Barbara are here with us. Would you, guys, would you mind coming up here? Do you mind? Come on, come on. Just so everybody can see, I asked them to come. He, he preached at his church and had to hustle over here. So I just want to say thank you from, uh, to both of them for being here and uh, the journey that we're on together. And uh, as you've heard me say, we think that God is doing something better together uh, than he would have done apart. So I'm, I'm going to give you the microphone if there's anything. Oh, you good, good. Maybe just, if you don't mind sharing just a brief word about your perspective, why, how you came to us. Because we didn't come looking for you. You came to us. And so what God's doing there. Probably for the last... Probably for the last five years, um, I saw the church beginning to go downhill. And I began to pray and pray. And, and I says, you know, unless someone comes alongside us and takes up the mantle with us, we're not going to make it. And so I've been tra uh, teaching my people that we have to turn the ministry over because it's not going anywhere. And it's not because we didn't work hard, try, try everything that you do here. It's just something wasn't right. And so I just pray, Lord, send someone to merge with. And during August, we were having a big summer bash, back to school bash for the kids across the street. And Al was driving by with his wife, Laura. And I says, do you know anybody that wants to merge any church? And he just laughed at me. He says, no. And I said, okay. And um, so we just went. And all of a sudden, he came back in, I believe, November mm -hmm. and said that Pastor Jeff was interested in possibly merging. So it was over a course of five years praying, asking God what to do. And when I met Pastor Jeff and the rest of the leadership team here, it was like a perfect fit. It was like God answered my prayer right then and there. And that's what I praise him for because our hearts are about winning souls. It's not about individuality. It's about God himself yeah. exalting the king himself. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, I, I felt the same way. Actually, I sent Pastor Bruce uh, for the first exploratory breakfast because I didn't know who this guy was, you know. And uh, Bruce came back and says, you got to meet him. And, and, we, and I felt the exact same way. We have, we have a kingdom vision that we share. Uh, and God, perhaps the reason that, that came that way is God has something better for us together than we would be apart. 
Uh, he's got bigger, bigger plans for them either of us saw, and we're excited to see where that goes. So uh, just next slide, if we could flip there to the, uh, I think there's some images of the campus. Um, this was shown in the video. We, uh, they did some drone footage, which is always so cool. But you can see the cornerstones across from Schneider Elementary School. Just off, that's Butterfield Road down there in the lower level, the larger, uh, just to orient yourself there. Um, the Fox River, you can see uh, that what was once up in the top left-hand corner, which, which was once um, Fox Valley Golf Club, is now being developed into uh, housing. Uh, it's less than a mile away from the campus. Uh, and so there's really lots of opportunity to reach our neighbors. These people are our neighbors. Many of us, there's 200 and... Oh, thank you. Well, this is just for fun. Look at that. Huh? Look at that, that, that. Butterfield Road. This is the thing. Yeah. Cornerstone. Okay. Ah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I've never used one of these before. New sermon toy. But uh, these, these uh, I meant what I said in the video about people should care about the people that live near them. Whether or, not they ever, whether or not they attend their church or not, we should be blessing to, to our neighbors. Your neighbors right now and our neighbors here. We, and we have 253 families living within three miles of that location. They're our neighbors. They already are our neighbors. Uh, and it's a great chance for us to learn from them, to love them, to serve them, and to reach them with the gospel for those that already aren't reached or looking for a church home. So um, you'll see a close-up here. Um, you'll see, and you saw it in the drone footage. Actually, this is good reason to use this little pad right here. That was... The original location of the church before it burned down, was it 11 years ago, Barb? Is that right? 2005, so more than that. 15 years ago, goodness. Uh, and then they rebuilt here, but that pad still exists. Which brings me to the point that we've been talking about. The building itself is move-in ready, meaning there's nothing structurally wrong with it. It's relatively new. It's, it's, it, there's nothing broken. It's operating fine. But if we were to put 100 or more people out there uh, on day one and children like we do with Mill Creek, a launch team, we would effectively fill it for one service on day one. If we grow it all, we're not going to have room for families and their kids. And that's what's all around the neighborhood. And so we think we have to not only renovate, but also add space to be ready for the neighbors before we launch. Which pushes back the launch timeline because you need time for construction. Which is actually good because as it happened with Mill Creek, it gives us time to prepare leadership and recruit a launch team and get ready internally before we launch externally. That makes sense. The court here, this is that which you saw from above, that's where we intend to build. We're still exploring whether or not we build a worship center there and renovate the current worship center into children's space and have a new entry lobby, whether we renovate or build children's space there and renovate the, new, the current worship center into a larger worship center. There are lots of opportunity, options, and each option has a price tag. So we're still exploring the most cost-effective way to do this, but still not compromising what we want to do there. Um, we think we can do it significantly cheaper than we did with Mill Creek, but for, for this reason, as well as the, the Shepherd's Heart reason, we, wanna, we need to push back our vote to sharpen our pencil and do more work on exactly what we're going to come to you to approve and, and, and approve us to go forward with financially. Does that make sense? Um, so we're excited about it. Nothing's changed. We're 100% believe this is what God has for us, but we want to do a little more due diligence and work, and we think voting in two weeks is too soon. We'll vote uh, after Easter. Um, and really what you're voting on is the, the approval of the church family for us to uh, raise and spend the amount of money it will take to do both projects. Um, and so we'll, we'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. Uh, let's see. Those are the last two slides. I want to bring up Abe uh, Doncel, our director of operations, executive director of operations here, because the question I was already alluding to and that we need now to talk about is how will we pay for this, and what's the financial picture and position of our church? So, Abe, come on up, and I'll let you play with this. I game. get the pointer now? Yeah. How about that? Oh, geez. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. It, this is a pretty exciting time. Can, can you admit, this is a great time, I think, to be part of Chapel Street and, and uh, what the Lord is doing here. And I know that uh, I've been honored to be uh, and privileged to be in the, in the role as uh, joining as Executive Director of Operations for just a few months now. Uh, but I'm equally humbled to be part of the team that is working to steward well uh, the gifts and resources that uh, this God has blessed this congregation with. And so what I want to do is take a little bit of time to share kind of what our current financial picture is, where we are uh, at this point in the year. We actually just finished our sixth uh, month of our fiscal year, so it's a good time to get a little bit of a pulse check. Uh, and then shift a little bit towards kind of where we are from a debt standpoint. What is our current debt position and some of the previous campaigns that we have and how might that position us as we look at these exciting opportunities that we have in front of us. 
You know, I have to admit that in my time and kind of coming in day in and out and working with the finance team and other teams, uh, I'm encouraged kind of on a daily basis just on the, the overwhelming generosity and, and um, commitment that this congregation has to, to the work that God is doing here. At the same time, I'm, I've been a little bit overwhelmed to see the, just the significance of that generosity. And if, you know, I'll share the numbers here in a moment to see just what God has done above and beyond what even we as leadership thought was possible uh, even a year ago. So let's take a look real quick. Let's jump in the first slide of kind of our financial highlights to date. As I mentioned, we just closed out February, which is our sixth month of our fiscal year. And as you can see, and I've shared this slide the last few meetings um, with, with the current data, so this is the most current now, but our revenues to date are about $390,000 over our general fund budget. So that's the, the budget we have to, to operate the church and, and the funds that come in on a weekly basis to, to cover our operating expenses. So you can see we're about 392,000 over budget. Uh, that is about a 15%, if you're if a percentage person, it's about a 15% uh, over budget run. Um, and I think it's important to note that not only is the 15% over budget, I think just something to be extraordinarily grateful for, but it's, I think it's important to understand that in the context of the budget overall, for those of you who were here and remember in August of last year when we voted on the budget, this year's fiscal year budget was a 12% increase over the previous year. So not only did we increase the budget by 12%, which was a, a pretty aggressive, I think at the time, uh, ask, uh, we are performing a, even above that another 15%. So I think it's just uh, extraordinary to see what, again, God's people are doing here. If you look at our expenses, uh, good news there is we're running a little bit under budget. Uh, we are about $50,000 under our, our operating expenses for the year. And that's, as I said in the past, uh, driven by a couple things. One is uh, the commitment of the staff and the due diligence of our staff here at Chapel Street to, to be intentional and be good stewards of the resources we have and make sure that we're uh, spending those, those um, funds wisely. And also just due to some staff turnover and open roles we have throughout the year, uh, we have a little bit of surplus there that we're that we're operating with. But I think the net net of that is you see the bottom bullet there. Currently our unrestricted or kind of operating cash on hand is uh, just about $878,000, which if you look at kind of what it costs to run the church month to month, that's about two, two and a half months worth of, of funds available. So that, uh, those funds again are important to understand are separate from our designated funds. So those here might recognize that we have certain designated funds, Serve the World, uh, the Benevolence Fund, um, other funds that are designated funds, those funds are separate from these. Those are in accounts that can only be used for this purpose, for those purposes rather. These funds, as you see here, are spe specifically for our operating expenses and what we do to run the church on a day in and day out basis. So I see that bottom highlight there at the bottom of the screen there. I think it's um, just something to be extraordinarily grateful for and to celebrate, again, the, the continued generosity of, of the people here at Chapel Street that we're giving is up just over 21% year to date versus the same period of time in our fiscal year last year. So with that, I do want to transition now and talk a little bit about, that, that's great news for now, and if there's a lot to be excited about, but how about the debt that we have currently, and, and how does that impact kind of where we are and where we might be going? So if we can move to the next slide. Um, I want to just talk about, for those of you who may be newer or just may, like me, be, uh, have a shorter memory, um, these are the two major capital campaigns that the church has undertaken in the last decade or so. Uh, you may recall Growing to Serve um, was uh, an initiative that was when we just had the two campuses, so east and west as it was back then, uh, but Growing to Serve was a capital campaign to do some significant improvements in this building as we did some expansion, uh, added uh, classrooms and added kids space and nursery, added our masterpiece uh, rooms that, uh, that have obviously been a, a huge blessing to, uh, to the community and to the neighborhood overall and did a number of other renovations in our lobby and, and think, uh, things here, as well as at South Street, did some significant work uh, at that campus for, again, the lobby, redesigned all the kids' space downstairs, did some move, uh, re, um, uh, redevelopment and uh, relocation, rather, of some of our offices, administrative offices. So all of that campaign was part of Growing to Serve, as well as the transfer of some of the previous debt that the church had was absorbed into that as well. So that was the Growing to Serve campaign, and that took place from like 2013 to 2016. Neighborhood Impact is the more recent one, as you may recall, and you've seen some of the, the images and videos of the last few family meetings have talked about that. That came uh, right on the heels of Growing to Serve, uh, not intentionally, but God was continuing to move. And that was the, uh, primarily around the addition of the Mill Creek campus. So a lot of the neighborhood impact uh, funds were used to build and renovate what is now our Mill Creek campus. There was also some additional work here in this room as we, re as we remodeled this space uh, in this auditorium here at Kesslering. I did some further work in our lobby and, and kids space. And then also some work with our Shepherd's Heart Ministry over at South Street. So those were all rolled into what was the neighborhood impact 
campaign. So those are the two campaigns that we now are, are managing and are continuing to service. So let's talk a little bit about the numbers. And there's a lot of numbers on the slide, so I'll kind of walk you through it. Let's start on the left-hand side with the Growing to Serve campaign. The total cost of that campaign was uh, approximately $6.3 million. Uh, we had pledge giving of just uh, 4.6, and obviously these are all rounded numbers. Um, to, uh, we received about 4.2 million of those pledges, but also received another 1.2 million of unpledged giving for a total giving uh, towards that uh, f- since the life of that campaign of $5.4 million. So that left us roughly 950,000 that we needed to finance and, and pay off uh, as part of our debt service. If you look at the right-hand side, uh, 2017 through 2020, and I might add, the Neighborhood Impact Campaign is still technically active. We, that campaign or the pledge, pledges for that go through the end of April, so we still have some time remaining for uh, additional pledges to come in. But as you see, the total cost of that campaign all in was just over 6.6 million, uh, pledge giving of 4.3, pledges that we have received to date, again, with a few months to go, 3.6 million, unpledged giving of just under a million, so our total giving to where we are in that campaign, it was just uh, over five, or just under 5.6 million, leaving us again about two, just over two million and change that we would have to finance through debt. So you see roughly about $3 million worth of, of debt that we would have had to carry over, over time. So what does that mean? What's that cost been? Where are we in that debt? Because we are you know, continuing to work through that. So let's jump to the, the next slide here. So if you look at our current debt information and the cost that it is where we are, um, We've got two loans that, we, that we're currently servicing. The Growing to Serve loan, which was included that debt, and also, uh, those of you may recall, when we uh, acquired the Mill Creek location, there was some debt that that church had at the time that we rolled into one loan uh, at, uh, with Growing to Serve, and so that loan has been paid down. That was initially 1.5 million. We're now down to 778,000 and change. Uh, we've got a, a real, I think, great interest rate on that, 3.25. Uh, you see our monthly payment there, and if we continue to pay at that rate, which is our intent, we would pay off that loan uh, in April of 2028. The neighborhood impact loan, uh, excitingly, is just below $2 million now, so we're at uh, 1.9 and change. You see the interest rate there and what that is locked to and and our current monthly payment for that. And again, if we continue to pay at that rate, we'll have that loan paid off shortly after in in September of 2028. So if you look at our current debt obligation, you add those two numbers together. We're currently, as of a few Weeks ago, we've probably had a little bit less now. We've made a payment, I'm sure, in the, in the interim, but roughly $2.7 uh, million is our current debt obligation, all total. Uh, the cost for servicing that debt, so taking our two monthly payments and adding that all together is just under $380,000. If you look at our current giving, so what our current uh, weekly and monthly giving comes in and you factor, what is it costing us? What percent of our income are we using to service that debt? It's roughly 6.8% of our overall budget. The way to th- of overall giving. The way to think about that in, in kind of a personal context for me was if you think of your own personal financial um, situation at your home and the money you have coming in on a monthly basis, if only 6.8% of those funds were, were going towards servicing your mortgage or your debt, that would be where we're at. So I think it's a very healthy number for some context and there's multiple uh, sources you can cite and multiple uh, kind of um, uh, uh, data points on this, but on average, the average church in America has somewhere between, uh, costs takes somewhere between 20 and 30% of their uh, general fund giving to service their debt. So we are well below um, what would be uh, typically seen and I think very healthy for us at this point. Obviously, we'd love to be debt-free. That's always the, uh, the goal and what we're moving towards, uh, but I think we're in a great position to, to service that. Let me just jump to one other slide here and put a little more context on this that may be hard to read, but as you see, so this is the two loans there. And what I wanna give you some context are is where have we been historically? So if you look back over the last 15 years um, at what our overall debt was, this is not the cost of servicing the debt, but the actual overall debt we had at that time as, as a percentage of our general fund giving. So back in 2004 to 2005, our general fund giving was just about two, uh, over $2 million or, or change, but our debt was close to under, just under $5 million. So we were at actually 189%, almost 190% of our annual giving relative to the debt that we were carrying at that time. You can follow from there in, in 08, excuse me, 09 and 10, uh, we had general fund giving at about two and a half million and our debt was uh, just over two million, so about 85% of that. Go ahead, Ken. Okay, so thank you. So when Abe showed us these slides earlier, they were beautiful color color. (laughs) slides, okay? As you can see, the color has bled slightly. So just to make sure you can understand, the debt level is on the left of those bars, the left bars, 
and the revenue level or the giving level is on the right, okay? Yes, that's Sorry. a good catch. He was flying through there, and I was like, they have no idea which bar you're talking about. <laughs> so anyway, that the, the debt is on the left, left. revenue right. on the right. Thank you, Ken. Yes, that's the, tr- the cost of transferring slides from PowerPoint to, f- to three other mediums in between uh, presenting. So yes, so thank you for class. So the debt is the left-hand bar, as you see, with the percentage over them. So when you see the percent over the bar, that's the percent of the, our total debt as it relates to our annual giving uh, at that point in time. So you see, we're, we're moving in a very favorable direction. Currently, if you look at where we're trending this year and, two th- and physical year 1920 is a forecast that we're only halfway through the year, but if we forecast what our giving will be as we continue through the remainder of this year, um, we're gonna end up somewhere between uh, five and a half to uh, 5.7 million in giving at our current debt of 2.7%. That's uh, just under 50% or, or 48% of our overall giving would be equivalent to what our, our debt is. So I hope that makes sense. I wanted to give a quick overview of that. I had a lot of numbers on the screen and a lot to digest. Um, but I think in summary, what I would just close and then I'll bring Jeff and Ken back up and we can move into some time of Q&A. Uh, I think it's an exciting time for us as a church overall. And I think as leadership, while we are absolutely committed to being good stewards of and, and being wise in the way that we're approaching our financial picture, we also want to be available to and, and be listening to what God is doing and where he's moving us you know, as a congregation, and I, I believe and just hope you have confidence in the team that's, that's managing this and watching this for all of you. So with that, I'll bring uh, Jeff back up, or Ken, or both. Thank you, Abe. Uh, let's, let's, um, we want to move to some time for Q&A, but just, just, just to make sure, <laughs> I'm not, you ever see that old Chevy Chase sketch where he's playing the president and he's in a, he's in a press conference, and they have all these numbers and, and about the budget, and he's like, it was my understanding there would be no math. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that when Abe starts talking about the debt. But the overall uh, thing I think it's clear is that we're in the, we're in the healthiest position we've been in, in in almost two decades in terms of our revenues and our debt service. Um, obviously, we want to continue that trend and see it get even stronger, but we're in a great, great position thanks to God's gracious provision, the work of His Spirit, and to the generosity of His people. So I don't, I want, to, I don't want to let that go without being said, that those numbers represent dollars that God's people are giving toward His work. We don't take that lightly. We want to steward that well and use that for his kingdom purposes, and we want to acknowledge that it comes from his hand, uh, and we're grateful. So um, I, I think, uh, well, let's just pause there, and I'm sure there are lots of questions that you have. We've got microphones, and again, as we've done in the past, if you would wait, raise your hand, we'll get to you, uh, but we want to capture the questions uh, on the mic so that we'll have them for those who will, will watch and listen later. So we've and got it, one, at least one. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. His, as right as we got to that, I thought it was like, that was a lot of data. Yeah. Okay, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna back it up, take it slow. You can ask us any questions about anything that we've talked about or anything we haven't talked about. This is the time we want to hear from you. So we got our first... You can even ask Pastor Frank a question. Yes, like, if I prefer you like. what you did. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, thanks. Yeah, uh, Deb Abs, and I love the, uh, the neighborhood impact and the fourth church idea. My question, though, is as um, Masterpiece Ministries is really the DNA, a lot in the DNA of our church here. Um, Oh, sorry. Masterpiece Ministries has a big part of our church here. How, as we explore in more neighborhoods, will that be part of those churches and allowing families with special needs to attend and help with the launches? It's a great question. Um, so much, Deb, thank you for that question. I, I know it's, you're active in that community and, and care about that ministry as well. Um, you're right. The Kessner campus is unique in that we have the physical resources here in space we don't have at some of our other ones. Much like Shepherd's Heart, we think we have to figure out creative and effective ways to represent Masterpiece at every one of our campuses as well as Shepherd's Heart. Well, we may not have everything at every campus. We think it's important that we have its representation, uh, the fact that at least advertising for Buddy Break, Masterpiece Moms, and when we can, building rooms for those families and kids at campus, especially once they get further out, that's a mission priority for us. So thanks for raising that. Yeah. I have a few questions. How many here, show of hands, how many here have gone down to look at that property? Not many, not many. How many here know that it's built on a slab? There's no basement. 
How many have been here when there's a service been on? What was that? I didn't hear that. I, Not I, many. I want to I say yes, but I don't know what you said. Sorry. Pardon? What was that last one? Last thing you asked, how many here what? Oh, I said, how many here have been to a service down there? I haven't. I've been here. <laughs> None of you. Just right. <laughs> and again, uh, it may look nice on the outside, but how many know that it's a slab, no basement in it? A few of you. There's only just a few Sunday school rooms. How many do you know of that? How many do you know how much it would cost to move that and put a basement under it? Nobody. Well, one, maybe. <laughs> it costs a lot. Which is, Plus the fact... You're quite right. This is why we're talking about we need to add space before we launch. That's, that's exactly why we mentioned that, at the, why I was talking about that. We need to... It's not, it's not large enough. You're right. They want to ask questions. Mill Creek is also on a slab, by the way. Just for context, Mill Creek is also has no basement, built on a slab. And uh, so, yeah, well, frankly, right. we have been down there. I've gone through it. There's no basement. It's built on a slab. You got a couple of small Sunday school rooms, and already that's the small chapel area is is full. So my big question is, how can we resolve these questions without doing a complete makeover on that whole program. Thank you. So, so thank you for that question, but um, I'm going to answer it this way by kind of going back to Mill Creek. If you remember when we, um, you know, took Mill Creek into the family, they're also a church that's built on a slab with no basement, um, and they also had some constraints based on the anticipated um, volume of people, number of people that will be going there, not, not just the number of people th there, but the number of people with families, lots of children. We're anticipating the same thing for this church, for this, for this environment. And if you saw in those pictures, the part that just gets me kind of giddy about this is right across the street, the elementary school. I, I cannot wait for that opportunity. Ken just, just used the word giddy, by the way. I, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a Southern term. But... Um, you know, so, so extremely excited about the opportunity there. And I think that's a little bit of the story is how do we position that facility to optimize it for the community and for the neighbors that are going to attend there? It will require change. And that's what we're looking at right now is what's the best way to do that? Uh, what's the best way to modify, use the space that's there because it's good space. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a good building. But we know there needs to be more. So that's what we're going through right now. And I'll go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. We probably will have another church family meeting so we can show you the drawings that we're working on right now that you'll be able to see those before you vote. So that's Maybe coming. we'll have snacks at that meeting because you've yes, come to coming, three on now. Coming so. to a meeting to you soon. Yeah. Um, okay. She has a question. Good, please. Do you want to do both projects at the same time? Yes. As far as, okay. Do, I, do we want to? Yes. But we're going to continue to hold that and see what God allows us to do. Uh, and, and the church would have to vote to approve that. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. But, we, but let me say more than just the word yes. Yes, because we see them as both mission critical parts of the neighborhood church vision. They're both linked in what we mean when we talk about that. The expansion of a fourth campus, reaching more neighbors, and also our compassion ministry go hand in glove. So. Hi, I'm Deborah. Um, when we talked about the other um, expansion at South Street, are we going to go ahead and expand the parking lot that we were talking about because of the service for one level? I know with our community at South Street, we've got some parking issues and some handicapped access. Is that still going to be addressed? Are you asking about the South Street parking lot? South Street. Um, okay, so th this is getting a little bit into the weeds, and I want to be careful that I, sometimes I, I say too many things. Uh, and so, I want to be, so what I'm about to share with you is, is, is work in progress, okay? This is not a promise. Um, some of the plans originally when we were thinking about the chapel that involved redoing the front, where, where parking close to the main entrance and that, that what I call the grassy knoll, we think we might have to repurpose those dollars to the, to the back to, for, to make this financially doable for Shepherd's Heart. So we would likely, although I'm not certain, 
not do the parking renovations in the front that we talked about uh, previously. Does that make sense? We'd want to spend that money elsewhere in order to, keep, to put it in the lower level. But again, these plans are being worked on uh, and will be continue to be worked on in the, in the weeks to come. But that, that's a good question because you're right. We won't be able to do everything. It's not lower level plus all the other things we talked about. Good question. Others? We've got one in the back. Michelle here. So you can make your way there. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, is it possible to rent the elementary school for Sunday school space, at least temporarily, while um, rent the elementary school for classroom space while you're under construction for the new campus? That's a great idea, Michelle. Um, I, Pastor Frank has a good relationship with the school. We have not yet explored that possibility. It might be possible. It, they met there for a time when they were when they were building the church that had burned down. So that's it's possible. I know it's also probable that we would park uh, there as well. They allow, they allow that as well as uh, the church allows the staff and faculty to park on their property during the school day. So there's a, there's a strong possibility of that if that was needed, if there was an interim time uh, to, prior to the public launch. It could happen. It's a good, it's a good thought. In the back. Uh, hi, I'm Angie Bateman. I have three. So first, I just would like to follow up with Deb ads that mm -hmm. I hope that we continue to look creatively to find ways for families to worship with children or adults with special needs right. at each individual campus right. and that you wouldn't have to drive by a campus to go to another one. My second question is, when you look at plans for remodifying a fourth campus, will you add an adult meeting room? Over at Mill Creek, all of our rooms are set up either for kids or large worship and we don't really have a room for like an adult Sunday school or adult meeting rooms. That's one of my questions. And then my other question is, when you're looking at reconfiguring at South, will there be a very nice handicap entrance to the um, food pantry? Uh, I don't know what you do mind when you say very nice, <laughs> but um, let me take them in reverse order. We're looking at the entrance for the, for the food pantry and ADA access and all of that. Again, this all comes down to cost and what we think is wise to spend at, the, at, the, at a certain time, but yeah, we're looking at those plans. The second question about adult rooms, we have no plans and do not intend to put forth the plans to expand the square footage at Mill Creek, although, Pastor Sir, we can talk about needs and, and for adult rooms. Um, so there would not be an increase in square footage at Mill Creek in this plan. Um, and then the, the, your first question about, I think you were just reiterating the special needs, we abs I absolutely agree with you and we're looking at the best way to do that at each campus. Um, but I thank you for those questions. Uh, maybe this would be a good time. Is there another hand waiting? If there's, if, while you formulate your questions, and I hope you do have them and keep asking, let me just take a moment because I want to, I, I assume this would come up, but since it hasn't come up yet, let me take a moment and say, maybe some of you are wondering who would go from our staff and who would go from our congregation. From our congregation, we would want to recruit a launch team, a core team, much like with Mill Creek. Not those who just want to have a small church and have their way somewhere else, but those who are passionate about reaching their neighbors, about serving their community. Be part of the, which is exactly what we did at Mill Creek. Many of you are, are, are here now and you're a part of that. We would do the same thing. And it would be led by a campus pastor. As you know, our, our model and mission and vision is not to put a screen up and, and have just a sermon on screen, but have pastoral leadership presence in each campus location and be predominantly live preaching with occasional video when it makes sense. Uh, that, which means you can only expand the rate you have leadership ready. We praise God that we think we have leadership ready, at least in terms of the campus pastor right now. And I want to just name him. I think most of you, may, it won't surprise most of you, but I want to name him Pastor Andrew Griffiths. Would you come up here, Andrew? If I had, if I had the laser pointer, I would point it right at him. So Andrew, and what I love about Andrew, in addition to that he's, he's now American, even though he sounds like he's still from Britain, he's an, he's an American citizen, is that he came to us uh, as our pastoral resident. He started out as, uh, in our residency program, learned uh, kind of the ropes here, uh, and, and grew up as, in his pastoral gifts as part of our community. Uh, many of you know him as the middle school pastor and his remarkable job he's done there the last several years and known him on our preaching team. It's so much fun because it's what God did in my life when I came here as a youth pastor years and years ago. And it's what happened in Sterling's life and in Brian, Pastor Brian's life. Uh, so many of us can tell the same story. I see it happening in, in another young man's life, and I'm thrilled about that, and so I want to just uh, acknowledge that and, and praise God for Andrew. You, uh, you can ask him questions, but he knows this. It's not a surprise to him. We've been talking and praying about this for months. Um, 
long before we knew about Pastor Frank and about, about uh, Cornerstone, we knew that, that God was preparing Andrew to be the next campus pastor. And so we're thrilled that it's come to this. Anything, we do, what, Mike, want to give him a chance to say something? Andrew, say something, un- unplanned. <laughs> say something. Make some unplanned remarks. It's what you have to do when you're campus pastor. Three points. Yeah, that's right, yeah. This really is very unplanned, so I don't know what I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, I will say, I, I'm really, I love this church to death. I, when my wife and I moved here, um, we were looking for a church, and my wife grew up here when it was First Baptist Church of Geneva, and I had no idea that we would, we would come back here. In fact, I was probably a little hesitant to, because it was, it was her church, and it wasn't mine, so I thought, let's find something that can be our own. And I remember coming in uh, when this was still a gym and sitting in a chair back there, uh, and finally finding a church that I had no criticisms of at all. Uh, I loved what? it. No, I know. It's amazing. The, well, the guy preaching was now. a bit of a loser, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but, um, no, and, and so I have, I have continued to fall in love with this church. I love that our church cares so deeply about God's word. I love that our church cares so deeply about our neighbors. Uh, and so I am, I'm really thrilled, honored, and humbled, uh, to be a part of whatever God is doing next. Uh, yeah, and I, I, even thinking about it right now, I'm very nervous, uh, because uh, I'm a, I'm a goofy guy, and I don't know why God would uh, position someone like me to do the things that he does. Uh, but uh, he's I'm very kind. I'm taking that you now. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but I'm excited, thrilled. Um, yeah, and I love this church. So. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. The, the truth is, what Andrew said, I don't know why God would choose a goofy like, guy like me to do his work. That's what every faithful pastor should say in their heart. Um, because I feel the same way. Yeah, so, about you. I mean, <laughs> about me. About me. <laughs> uh, very grateful for Andrew's heart and excited to see. So, obviously, the, the choice of the t- staff team that would go with him, and just for context, we, we, we would do something similar we did at Mill Creek. There'd be a part time worship leader, uh, a children's Chapel Street Kids director, and some connections coordination. So, we'd have a team of, of people that would go with him. He's going to be part of, of, of recruiting and training those people um, and the core team that would go with him. But that all needs to be, we need to wait until we have the church vote because this is something our, as a church family we have to agree to. And if for reasons that I hope don't happen, but I, I can't fathom, but if the reasons that God has this isn't what he has, then we, I don't want you to think that we put the cart before the horse here, because we knew Andrew was the next campus pastor before we knew about this campus. Um, but if this is what God has, we're going to wait on those decisions until we've had kind of the official yes from the church family to move forward, and then we'll begin to make public about the plans to recruit and train and develop. And to Michelle's point, that will take some time while we're doing some renovations. There, it might be we meet in the building and use some of the school space during that time. It might be we do what we call the incubation period in one of our other venues at one of our other campuses for a period of time while there's construction going on there. That all has to be figured out uh, with timelines, and we'll do that down the road. So another question in the back? Um, my name is, oops, sorry. Uh, my name is Tim Lathrop, and as we roll this out, this is the first time that I've been present for an expansion with this church, um, how do we ensure that we are not weakening or taking away from the core groups that are 915, 1045, the South Street campuses, the Mill Creek campuses, Mm. and now that we know who the the pastor is, how do we make sure that the middle school ministry isn't negatively impacted here at Kesslinger and throughout the program? Great. Um, Tim, Tim I'm, I'm so glad you were honest enough to ask that question because I know that's in a lot of people's minds, even if not here in our church family. And, and I can answer it best by review, rewinding the tape to when we launched Mill Creek. Sterling and I remember we had many of these conversations, exact conversations. And I remember talking to Sterling about you can recruit anybody you want to go with you. And, and some of our own staff were like, don't take them because those are my best people and it will be a loss to us. The first thing we have to remember as a church family, there is no us in them. It's all us. This is all kingdom win. This is all gain for God's glory. This is all more people coming to know and, and, and experience the grace of Jesus Christ. So it's all, it's all us. There's no us in them. Uh, but having said that, yeah, there's, there's a, a real concern at times about what happens to this campus. I can tell you this. We took 130 initially, 140 to, for the launch team uh, to go launch at Mill Creek. The numbers tell you that we backfilled that in no time uh, here at Kesslinger. It, it was... A, it, and more. 
So not only have we've more, we've more than doubled that, we backfilled that and doubled the number of people that are attending here. So the growth rate isn't slowing down. In fact, it might help alleviate some of the space issues we have here at 915 um, with the launch team. Uh, when it comes to staffing, that's maybe the bigger challenging question. But much like when Sterling was going to be the campus pastor over there, many of you were asking, well, what about high school? What about student ministries? We love Sterling. Taking him away will hurt that. And we see God, every time that's happened, God brings people to us or raises people up from within us to fill in those gaps. And it's just beautiful. It happened in my life. It happened in Sterling's life. And I have every confidence it'll happen again. In fact, we're working on those plans already. Uh, but it'd be, it would be presumptuous to start talking about them at this point. We will not leave those ministries understaffed, underfunded, and underled. So I can tell you that much. Anything to add there, guys? Pastor John Bechtel, who's here, will be in charge of that. So if it doesn't go bad, just talk to him. <laughs> Galen's got his hand up and other questions. I have a question. My name is Lee Rick. Uh, in sight of the uncertain economic times, what kind of contingencies are you building in? Good. Maybe Aber Ken can speak to that or unless you want me to. Um, I think the key word there is uncertainty. It's hard to, to plan for a lot of that. We are just um, looking at, given the most recent action of actually the Fed and, and cutting rates, we, we are actually engaged with our bank currently to see if we can even get better terms on the loans that we, that we presently have. And so we're exploring that um, uh, imp as we, like I said, as we speak this week and going forward. We are constantly looking at, uh, at trying to anticipate it and forecast what the giving trends would be. We're, we're not uh, as we look at what we will do with Fourth Campus and what we'll do with Shepherd's Heart, uh, as the leadership, we'll have to determine what is the appropriate amount of debt that we believe is manageable, both now and going into the future, uh, based on the best information we have and the best uh, forecasting we can do. But we're, you know, we believe that if this is God's plan, if this is what he's doing, that he will provide those resources. And so while we want to be wise and thoughtful around that, we also want to be uh, trusting and, and, and being faithful to what uh, he's calling us as a, as a body and what he's calling us individually to do in, su in support of that. So uh, we'll continue to look at that again. No specific uh, you know, information yet or no decisions yet, but we certainly appreciate both you know, with an election coming and all things coming on, we know that those all have factors that we need to be aware of as we move forward. So I don't know if you have any. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm um, actually very glad you asked that question. Um, actually, Jeff and I got a letter uh, after the last uh, church family meeting from a very nice couple, very excited about what we're doing, very excited about uh, the, the, the two events, uh, but said, you know, somebody asked a question about debt during that, and it, it felt you were a little bit light on the answer. Uh, and so we committed to giving you a lot of information this meeting. Hopefully you've seen a lot of that, and uh, you're comfortable with the, the data that you're seeing. We want to be very, very transparent on that. So we do want your questions, incredibly important. Uh, very appreci appreciate the time Abe puts into to giving us that detail. Here's one of the things I, I want you to hear, though. One, uh, I want to reiterate the position that we're in in terms of health. Uh, extremely healthy. Obviously, you've seen that the percentage of our giving in terms of debt uh, is going down. Uh, you also see the serviceability, serviceability of our debt. Uh, we're running at about 6.8% of our general fund giving or, or available funds to pay down debt, which is an extremely healthy position. So those are all very good news. At the same time, I also want to make sure you hear that to do these two projects, if we vote to do both of them, we will take on more debt. Okay, we don't know exactly how much yet. We're going to try and get those numbers to you as quickly as possible. As I mentioned, we're expecting another church family meeting where we will go through the very fine detail of what exactly what we're asking for in terms of additional debt. But we will be taking on additional debt. It won't be enormous, and I, still, I believe it will be very responsible. As Abe said, we're being very careful to make sure that the plans we put in place are responsible against all of the factors that we can know at this time. Whether you think about the economy, the election, and yes, I'm going to say it, the coronavirus, whatever, whatever those factors are that impact that, we're going to try and make a very responsible proposal to you in terms of, of taking on additional debt to do these two projects. So um, I'm going to have to, though, ask you to kind of trust us a little bit as we're working through the detail on that, but that will be forthcoming very soon, and that really is our commitment to try and make sure it's both responsible and faithful. Let me, let me jump in as well, Ken, because I agree with what both Ken and Abe have said. And the debt... I'll tell you what my prayer is. That if the church family approves this and we move forward, that the debt we need to take on would be short-term, the, the, the short-term construction loan to get us going. 
I think we have a congregation that is more than capable of rising to the challenge and meeting the financial need to do this. I think we see that in the generosity numbers we're celebrating. I think we see that in the trajectory of the church. I also don't want to be guilty of what Pastor Brian often called magic money thinking. Well, God will provide. Like there's a money tree out back that pastors know about. It doesn't work that way. It means God's people have to give. But I intend, uh, and if, if approved, to call our church to that. They say, look, this is the total amount it would cost to do both of these things for the glory of God and for the good of the mission here. This is what it means. And we're asking you to consider what you give above and beyond to make this happen so that we would not add long-term debt onto the debt we already have. But I, I understand that needs to be held loosely because God is going to do what he's going to do and he does it through our view of the church. Um, and so um, it's very easy to think, well, somebody else with deeper pockets will do that. Somebody else, and that's, it's us. So I, I do believe in my heart of hearts that if we're talking about a three, three and a half or four million dollar project of an all in number, I don't know what the number is, I'm throwing numbers around and Ken is getting nervous, but that we could do that as a church. We could do that as a church without taking on long-term debt. I believe that, but God will have to do that in our midst, so. Chris, oh, Galen, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, you, you answered some of the question I had, which was, what were the thoughts on financing the proposed projects? Uh, I'd forgotten about the growing to serve, and I think there was one previous to that. Building on faith. Building on faith. You built um, this. That's right. Yeah. So my question is more generally, how will you uh, position the goals of the church financially? Maybe to wrap them all together or make it clear. If I wanted to give money, for example, on going to serve to help pay off that debt, how would I know to do that? Does this mm -hmm. make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Just, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, well, uh, I think one of the ways is w what Abe just did today is making is getting a little clearer because these these names of campaigns get lost in the past and it's hard to remember what was for what. And so I think for a larger audience, which we're doing now and we tend to do more, what those were uh, and, and why they matter, how to give to them. Um, so, but I, I, I think I would like to do this, and this may be pie in the sky thinking, but I don't think so. I'd like to be able to do this without another three-year campaign. To just say, this is what it costs. This is what God's given us. Let's see God's people move and give to this. Um, and not, not, not pledge it out over three years. Part of that, I think we, we, I think we have the infrastructure and generosity and resources to do that. Also to Lee's question, uh, it, you don't know what the, the climate's gonna be like in three years. You don't know what the landscape, how it's gonna shift in three years. And so um, I'd, I'd rather do that. But we wanna, um, I can't force that to happen is my point. God's gonna have to do that amongst his people. One of the good things is in the process of doing this to your question, we are looking to kind of simplify a lot of this because we do have a lot of this campaigns. This, all that will be sort of done at the end of April. So we won't have any active campaigns. We'll basically have a building fund that you can give to um, and that's and, and the other funds that we have. So we are, we are have the ability or the opportunity to sort of simplify that. And also, as Abe mentioned, one of the things he's looking at with the banks right now is, is there an opportunity to consolidate some of that debt into a single term loan, hopefully one with a lower interest rate. It needs, to be, it needs to be low enough that it makes sense and the fees and all that kind of stuff work out. So he's looking at that right now. But it is our intention to simplify that so that when we bring uh, the, yeah. the proposal to the church, it, it makes sense in terms of how to give, what we're actually giving to, and sort of our timelines for uh, sort of completing all of those, those uh, activities. Does that make sense? But that, that is some of the data we will be providing. Chris. You may not have a, oh, sorry. You may not have an answer to this yet, but I'm just curious in moving Shepherd's Heart down to, downstairs on the lower level, is there any plan even beginning about how much or whether you will keep space for children's? Yes, good question, and I'm not surprised you would ask it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, let me explain, no? <laughs> There was too much. Let me sum up. <laughs> if you don't know the movie reference, that's the shame. <clears throat> Let me say that broadly, we, we intend to keep and protect space for kids' ministries, including nursery, toddler, and, 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 and children's ministries. We have more than we need on the lower level right now, even if we were to grow. Um, so we're looking at, and again, I want to be careful of saying, getting too far down the road here. We're looking at everything, um, what direction is that? Is it West? Everything to the west of what's now Kids Station. Down that slope, that ramped hallway, 
all, all both sides of those now Shepherd's Heart storage and some classrooms, all of that space being used for the purposes we're talking about. Again, I don't want to go any further because there's, there's a lot of questions you're going to ask that we won't be able to answer yet. But that's so preserving what's currently kids' space, reconfiguring nursery space. So we would not eliminate all of kids and, and children's space there. We wouldn't. That wouldn't be unwise. Question. For the new campus, the fourth campus, what capacity size are you looking at for the auditorium oh, portion? Good. And secondly, because land is, um, it's on a smaller plot of land, mm -hmm. could you go up like two story for classrooms and that as opposed to being worried about a basement or expanding outward? Um, up is, Dave, Dave, Dave behind you can answer this as well. Up, up is expensive. Up is exponentially more expensive to go up, so we would try not to do that. Uh, to your second, your first question I'll answer about this capacity. The, currently, the worship center seats 220, somewhere in that neighborhood, if you, if you pack it full. We think it probably needs to be uh, 250 to 300. Uh, so then you could have two services there and comfortably a church of 500 in worship plus kids' space. So the, the footprint, the, the land, while smaller, admittedly, than Mill Creek, uh, does, could support that. And we're doing the studies for that and the parking needed and so on. So um, that's, that's the size we're thinking about and the expansion we're thinking about. Whether we do it all at once or in stages, we're still determining. And I remember, I, we do have the relationship with the school across the street that do. allows us to use that parking space. That's right. Okay. okay. Oh, got to go in order of hand raised. This is not a question. It's a comment. My name is Ruth. Hi, Ruth. And um, I would just like to say that from personal experience, this church, Cornerstone, has a real heart for service. Hmm. I don't have any doubt that all of the uh, physical needs of the church to come can be met. Hmm. That can be done by creative people. But they are already reaching out and have a very good reputation in that neighborhood and in that area for service. Uh, they have a food pantry, small food pantry. They're very active in helping a uh, good relationship with the school. And from our personal experience, uh, over at Greencastle, which is a low-income seniors housing, about three minutes away where our daughter is the social, work, uh, social worker there, they have, the women of this church, and they're only a, f a small group of people, have, have faithfully had a Bible study for the people at Greencastle for 13 years every week. And they have had birthday parties, and they have had monthly meetings for the women. They have done so much for them. And they even came to my daughter. Oh, I'm so glad you told, I was gonna ask you to tell this story, which you, yeah. They came to her last October, and they said, would you please pray for our church? We just are such a small group, and we need help, but we don't know what to do. We're just waiting on the Lord and asking him to help us to be incorporated into some other organization that could help us to come alive again. So they are already alive, <laughs> but they just need a boost. And yeah. so I just say, praise God for these faithful people and yes. what they have done Amen. all this time. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Ruth, Ruth pulled me aside after a, a word and table service a couple weeks ago and told me that story that her daughter shared with her about these women asking those women at Greencastle to pray that God would bring a church to partner with long before any of us knew before I knew Pastor Frank or any of that, I thought how God works. So. Hello, my name is Joan. Uh, the first question is, has Cornerstone already voted to merge? And if not, what would that time frame be? Will both churches vote on the same Sunday or whatever? And the other question is more practical. Is there any debt that is being taken on by the Cornerstone Church? Thank you for your questions. Uh, the answer to the first question is yes. The answer to the second question is no. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, really great questions. They have already voted. Uh, they voted two weeks ago. Is that correct, Frank? And they voted unanimously to approve, uh, and they're waiting on us to get our act together. So we're working on that. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I, uh, all kidding aside, I think it's really a beautiful picture. They have voted yes, 
and, and feel like this is what God has brought to us. We've been through, our, Pastor Frank and some of his board and, and me and, and Ken and some of our board have been through what we call the feasibility phase, discussing uh, the issues that may become sticking points and worked through all of those. And so really what we're waiting for is the financial component to bring to you so we can vote all at once on these two things. This, and your second question, um, remind me again? Oh, oh debt. Uh, no, unlike Mill Creek, there's no debt. They're debt-free. There's no debt that we would acquire uh, or absorb from that, camp, from that congregation, which is another great blessing from God. A, a hand up over here, and then we got a microphone here to Tim. So, Jeff, two things. One, one comment and one, one question. Comment first, just thank you for your leadership in the Executive Council, for how you guys handle this, how prudent you've been in going through this process. It's refreshing to see that and, and a blessing to this church, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, second thing is a question we saw in a church meeting several meetings ago where there were monies that were set aside already for the fourth campus. Uh, Shepherd's Heart, for Shepherd's Heart. Okay. Oh, oh I'm sorry. In, the, in our general fund budget, yes, um, uh, there was some set aside for a fourth campus. That's correct. Right. But that and then also monies have been donated toward Shepherd's Heart as well. Yes. How are those funds all being applied to what we're working towards here for, Good. This, for these two campaigns? Good question. Thank you. I, I, I jumped the gun. You were already clarifying the question that I didn't understand. Um, so we, we have set aside money in our general fund, a small, small, relatively speaking, amount, but for multiplication, for the eventual next thing, long before we knew this. And so that money would go toward the launch. Uh, we, we, it could be used for staffing. We had, I think we thought initially just building a war chest for when God brings us an opportunity for staffing needs, uh, facility needs, and so on. So that would be, we just allocate that money toward the total cost of, of the launch. The Shepherd's Heart money is something, and this is just in full disclosure, when we began to talk about these plans, I began to talk to people that were passionate about Shepherd's Heart and love it, and, and they got excited and pledged and gave money that I actually didn't have uh, approval to raise yet. So we, <laughs> so we put it in a fund that, uh, and said, well, wait on that. So we do have uh, over half a million dollars and, more, and, and about another quarter million commit, verbally committed to the Shepherd's Heart Project, which is very, very exciting, and play, praise God for that. But that's, that money needs to be used for that purpose, for Shepherd's Heart expansion. So once we have those plans in place, whatever the total cost of that project is, would come down by that, that committed and pledged amount already. Which is great, I mean, we're thrilled about that. Yes, Jeff. Or... I, my, uh, my doctor's degree is in uh, organizational leadership and change. And I studied how organizations grow and what they do. And I just wanted to point out that what we're doing here by taking on another church is saying a great deal more than just we've got some money and we're going to buy a church. Mm. It's saying a great deal to the community about how we believe God has blessed us mm. in this facility in Mill Creek, which we've been attending now for the past mm. three years. People see these things, and they understand that the church is growing and that we believe in the church. Mm -hmm. Am I making any sense to any of you? You are to me. It's a, it's a statement for the community about our belief that God is going to take care of us and all, mm -hmm. all we do. And, and it also says to them, we really care about this community. Yeah. Yes, here right, we, here we right. sit in, um, in Geneva, a prosperous, nice community, and if we don't spread outward... What is that saying to the people mm -hmm. in the poor sections of Aurora yeah. or the poor sections of Elgin? We need to be aware of what these actions are literally saying to other people. I stop. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, and I would also add, I think it says something about our belief in the church, that the church is bigger than any. Like Chapel Street Church is not the church. We're part of it. Cornerstone is not the church. They're part of it. God's capital C church, his kingdom is much, much bigger. And I, I see this. I mean, we talked about this. It was very evident that Pastor Frank and I share the same kingdom vision as well as many of our staff and many of you, that this is about something much, much bigger than any one of us are doing on our own. And so I think it is also communicating what we believe the church actually is. It's not our brand. It's God's work. So. Yeah, what I heard was campus number five in Elgin. That's what I heard. <laughs> Come on, Ken. <laughs> okay, we're, 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 we said we'd stop at 145. We probably have time for one more question if there is one burning that wants to be asked. Uh, yeah, yeah. You already had your turn, Sorry. Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> it seems like about six weeks ago there was a request for volunteers to run kids station mm -hmm. and some other things and I don't remember the numbers might have been maybe as many as two dozen um, as we spread out kind of back to the question that was asked back there earlier how we've grown in giving have we grown in serving 
mm -hmm. as it relates to programming that we need to run Sunday services or a masterpiece or a food pantry somewhere else? That's good, really my question. Good question, Clark. Thank you for it. Um, so the, the, the macro answer is yes, because we track new, new servants, new serving opportunities, and people engaged in service, and those numbers are going up in our church history. Uh, the specifics more is like um, in, in particular ministry areas, they have acute needs. Uh, people respond. For example, there were 32 new servants in Buddy Break, 32 new buddies serving in Buddy Break, uh, which is over 100 buddies this past or two, two Saturdays ago. So people are responding to that. M Becky's here. She could probably speak more to the, the ongoing needs in kids, Chapel Street Kids Ministries. So. But th th there's a relationship to growth and needs for service because as we're growing, we're attracting families that are coming here. Those families have kids. So we're, it's, it's more keeping up with the pro programmatic needs in-house. But I can tell you, I do see God moving, not just in generosity, but in servant hearts. We are seeing more people get engaged in service. We, that doesn't mean that every spot of need in, in our programs is already met. They aren't. So uh, I, I hope you don't, those things aren't incongruous. They're actually in tandem. Um, so anything, you, Becky, you want to add to that? Give the mic to Becky. I can tell that she wants to. <laughs> She's just going to say, come serve, come serve. There you go. Come serve, which I know you already do. I know you already do. Hey, I want to take a moment before we wrap up and just recognize the members of our executive council. We've had two uh, uh, extra meetings added, lots of email exchanges. We have more coming, and I just so appreciate their work, which is above and beyond their other jobs uh, and their family life and, 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 the, and the prayer and effort, leadership effort they give to this initiative. So I want you to see them, recognize them, and, and uh, pray for them. So if you're on the executive council, would you stand up so we could see you? And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This space. That this is not this is these are these are not decisions that I make in a vacuum. We make these in tandem with our church leadership, our senior leadership team, which John and Abe, um, and, and our staff, and of course our executive council. So they're they're really really valuable. So. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And and I could say likewise for the staff. Uh, they are putting in a lot of extra hours, and, and as things move, obviously that takes more time to to get things aligned. So very much appreciate Jeff and Abe and all the rest of the staff. Uh, working on this. There is a lot more work to do as we've been discussing with you, and we are working on that quickly. We do believe that the time is now, and so uh, we are looking to position to take a church vote right after Easter. So in our next, next church family meeting, what we'll be doing is providing for you uh, some more detail, certainly the financial detail, hopefully some visuals as well. And then we will provide uh, some specific motions that we will put on the table for your consideration for the church vote. We'll also be providing that detail on all of our websites, all of our different avenues of communication, and including to the, uh, the you know, old fashioned ink on paper, the good stuff, that'll be out in our lobbies. And so you'll have all of that information in preparation for the church vote. So again, very much appreciate your time today. I uh, don't want this to be a singular meeting, want this to be a conversation. So as I mentioned, Jeff and I have gotten letters and emails and we want you to continue to send, ask, uh, converse with us, give us your thoughts, ask your questions, etc. cetera. Uh, between now and the next church family meeting, we don't want this just to happen at these meetings, but as, as much as we can provide uh, to get you the day, to get you, to comf get you comfortable with where we're going, and again, get your input, um, that's, that's what we want to do. So again, very much appreciate your time today. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Get outside. And with that, I'm going to ask Rusty Bland if he would close us in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we, we are so grateful for um, your grace, and we're, we're so grateful for the Lord Jesus and his, his saving work for us and his cover for us, and um, he goes before us, God, in this as well, and so we, we want to lay our lives down as an act of worship as well. Um, you, you own everything, and uh, you are uh, our, our pioneer. You are uh, in front of us in this, Father, and so we just we want to lay our lives down. We want to lay everything that you've given us down um, because we want to see much made of you. We want to see those that are far from Jesus be brought near, uh, those that are um, without a voice, God, to be given a voice and restoration to happen, and we want your kingdom. And so as we work through these things um, as a team, uh, we pray a hedge of protection around leadership, God, and we just ask that we'd be faithful, um, each and every one of us. And so I'm so grateful for our staff, and I just thank you for the vision that you've put in front of them, and, um, and we just would ask that your, your presence would be with us as we continue to journey through this, 
and that we would bring much glory to you in all of this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.